thank you for organizing this. I think I'm, I'm the last speaker. And uh, in any case, I think it's so important that we have these summer schools where people get together, learn things, network with the professor. I think it's a big, it makes a really, really big difference. I also want to encourage everyone who's seeing this to please participate with questions. Um, last time we did an interactive tutorial. Today, I want to try and talk about related research. Um, some of them, uh, yeah, like the, a lot of the research that I've done over the last couple of years. So let's, let's, let's see how we get there. So uh, just as a reminder, you've seen this slide yesterday, um, how when we do Bayesian or normative models, how we specify objectives and bounds, and then we calculate their best solution and we compare with actual behavior. And I first want to remind you of the kind of phenomena that we modeled yesterday. Now, so um, here's the Alea and Bar paper, which is a really cool setup. They show a little visual stimulus, like click, you, you see it, it flashes on the screen. And then you also hear a sound. As, as I told you, if you hear a sound, your localization might be precise to maybe 30 degrees or so. And what that means is, if the visual stimulus is really good, like the four degree stimulus that we have here, we will get this phenomenon of visual capture. And you might remember how yesterday when we did the tutorial, when the visual stimulus is very narrow and the auditory stimulus is quite wide, we have what's called visual capture. That is basically the visual stimulus dominates regardless of where the sound comes from. You will always say it comes from that place. So to counterbalance that, what, uh, uh, that what they did is they then blurred the stimulus where they used, they showed it a small stimulus, a little like an LED or a medium stimulus or a really large stimulus, a lay and bar. And this, so this is just to repeat what we went over yesterday. Um, we have an auditory prior uh, set up here. We have a visual, uh, or we have an auditory likelihood function set up here. We have a visual prior that we see here. Now, if we multiply the two of them, we get something that's both narrower and higher with the new estimate being, uh, being basically the weighted combination of the visual and the auditory position. So um, how do these experiments look like? You can ask for localization. You can also ask for the error that people make. You know? like, and if, uh, so in this case, uh, they made it so that vision uh, gives you so, so so if you have vision you have a certain error of 1.4 here audition you have an error of roughly 1.4 if they are optimally combined we should have that we have that if each of these are roughly squared of two then it should be one afterwards and this is exactly what they found in this historical experiment of Ali and Bar. and the reason why I talk about the historical experiment or many of the historical experiments is because all the things that people do at the moment in a way are layered on top of it. So the things that the, the old experiments from the early 2000s, they still drive the way we do electrophysiology today. They drive the experiments we, today, we do today. They, they, they drive a lot of current progress in science. So those were the LA and Bar experiments. Let me give you an example of our own experiment. What we did is we put people onto a force plate. A force plate measures how their body moves. And then what we did is we um, make the, move, uh, the dots move left or we make the move, dots move right. Now, if I show you lots of dots that move leftwards, then uh, then it will feel to you as if your body is moving rightwards, not like, uh, like that's uh, the standard effect of faction here. And um, we, what we then did is we did one experiment where we measured the uncertainty. So we, we basically said, okay, here you have a movement, here you have a different movement, which one moved faster? Or which one moved towards you? In fact, that was how the stimulus worked. It, it's, it's, it's like that screensaver on Windows machines, now where stuff moves towards you or it moves away from you. 
And then we basically figured out what the likelihood was by basically just saying, how big do I need to make the difference in speeds so that people actually see that there's a difference? And then what we also did is we measured, and that's what we have on the x uh, on the y-axis. We measured the we measured the amount of body movements that they had, the center of pressure deviation <coughs> integrated over it. On the x-axis here, we have the stimulus velocity. It's an arbitrary unit, so because we're just talking about like stimuli that go to the outside, which means that you're really getting closer, or that go inwards, which means that you get further away from it. And then for each stimulus velocity, we did two experiments. We did the experiment where we moved it and asked, is this faster or is this slower? This is what's called two alternative false choice experiments. And then what we also did is we saw how the forces uh, evolved. And then what you see here in error bars and uh, you see what in, in solid lines, you see our measurements and you can see with that simple prior likelihood integration, you see what the model is in, in dashed lines. And what we see here is that, uh, that, that the first thing is if the stimuli are better, then we rely more on them. Now that's the standard, that's the same effect as, as we were modeling before. If like- Conrad, it, just a yes. clarification. Yes. Uh, so so what, what is the subject uh, supposed to respond with when, so you're measuring ah. the force, but what is the response that they are supposed to do? So this so, is just a uh, stimulus that's coming on, right? Yeah, that's it. That is the crazy thing. So there's two settings. In one setting, they use two buttons and say, was the first movement faster or was the second movement faster? And, and then there's the other movement where all they have to do is watch the screen, nothing else. But if you watch the screen, you're going to use the movement that you see to estimate how fast you are to estimate what's straight. So if it, if it looks like it's coming your way, you're like, oh, my God, I must be swaying forward. So all we do is we tell people, don't look away. And you can uh -huh. see the, 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 the effects that we have here, are of, of course, pretty weak. It's just a little bit. You know, like if I if I go to the screen and you have my video full screen and I just do this, you will show a little bit of a of a going away and vice versa. And it's really just this effect that we're using here. It's great that you're asking. Okay. I want to ask, encourage anyone, please ask me questions. That's that's what makes it useful. You might ask me questions that I can't answer, but it's still <laughs> it's still good to have those questions. So so this is just a simple experiment, and in this case, we just saw that uh, we can predict the effect of vection, which is this like effect towards moving stimuli, exclusively based on the uncertainty that, that people have at, at detecting those. So I want to just talk about a few others. So, so here we're just talking about prior likelihood integration. So here we have another case where, where Alan Stocker here measured the prior that people have on the right-hand side about speeds of stimulus, a stimuli. So this is a classical vision experiment. So if you haven't seen those vision experiments, what they do is they take like a little hole, everything outside of that little hole is just grayed out. And then behind that hole, they take a moving stimulus uh, uh, like this. And those moving stimuli, you can then change how fast they move and you can change the contrast. And you can assume that what people do is that they have a prior and they combine it with a likelihood. And um, you can then say, can I estimate what is the underlying prior? And the way we do that, or the way it is in fact what it's explained in tutorial three, if anyone's interested in going further on the neuromatch tutorials. So what you effectively do is you take a prior, you give it a lot of parameters. In this case, you can say Alan Stocker gives it nine different parameters, which is each of the black dots. And then you can say, now that I have these parameters, how can I change the parameters so that the human behavior gets to be as probable as possible? It's what's called maximum likelihood fitting. So you take lots of data where you ask people, well, is this thing faster or is this thing faster? And in one case, it's, it's moving a little faster. In the other case, it might be more blood. Now, if, if things are more blood, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of background between this. So make sure you ask if anything is unclear. So if things are more blurry, 
it's harder to see that they move. What's the effect of that? It means that I may, if I make things more blurry, you will think that they move more slowly. Why? In the real world, slow movements are frequent and fast movements are common. And there you see a quantification of that by Roth and Black on the left-hand side. <coughs> what they did is they took lots of videos of natural scenes so in, and they, they took what's locally seen and then they asked, how does it locally change? And then they, so they basically produced the best fit to see how real world scenes change. And they found that, it, uh, that, uh, that you get a law like this, where you have exponential decrease in frequency as you go towards higher speeds. What does that mean? It means lots of times the world is not changing around us. That is what we see here in the middle. Now that is very frequent. The movement is, the world is not moving. And then sometimes the world moves just a tiny bit. Where is that coming from? Say, if I have a camera, then the camera will, usually it will be stable, but sometimes the camera will pan, or we have some objects that are maybe far away that will do some movement, maybe we'll have a car moving or something like that. And then very rarely we'll have objects that move really, really quickly in our visual field, maybe something that's thrown or just something that moves fast and is close to us. But that is much, much more, uh, more unlikely. And that is what this Roth and Black paper really very nicely shows that in the real world, in the visual world, slow things are very common and fast things are very uncommon. So what we have is we have no, uh, we have, no, this is the log number of occurrences. So this is exponential. So we have an exponential function for the occurrence of speeds. And now if I, if I multiply this with a Gaussian with which I observe movement speed, what's gonna be the result? Well, if I, just like we had before, if we have a Gaussian and we multiply it with um, an exponential, that means that, that I have e to the sum term in x squared plus some other term in x, which means that it's again a Gaussian. So this is the domain where we can really nicely do these things. Um, and what we can see is if, um, if in, people, uh, in people's minds, they had Gaussian priors over velocities, we should have found, uh, Alan Stocker should have found all the data points along this uh, dot dashed lines. Instead, he found the points here. So what people do is they don't always assume Gaussian distributions. When it comes to speeds, they shouldn't use Gaussian distributions because the world doesn't have a Gaussian distribution. They should assume exponential distributions. And it looks like that's exactly what people are doing. <coughs> Sorry, I had to. I had to run here this morning. Um, so, uh, what else? Um, and and I'm trying on purpose to give you a little bit of an overview. You no, know? so what what we did yesterday is we looked at the underlying math and at the underlying derivations and at the underlying simulations. Today, I want to like a little more give you an idea of the many different applications that this broader domain has. So on the left-hand side here, what we see is a, an fMRI paper by Irish Villaris. She took pretty much the same experiments that we talked about, uh, where you move and then there's the perturbation. The perturbation is noisy. And you can then experimentally make priors be noisy, and you can make likelihoods be noisy. Now, like, how do I make uh, priors uninformative or noisy? I make it that there's many, many different possibilities. For example, what we often do is we, in my lab, we used to mostly do movement signs. So we have a target that appears somewhere. That target can always appear within a narrow range or within a really wide range. That way we can change the prior. We can also change the likelihood in the same way as Ale and Burr changed the likelihood. They had either small blur or they had large blur. And um, what Irish realized did in that paper, she then asked, well, what happens if, uh, are there parts in the brain that are more active if the prior is good? And are there act parts of the brain that are more active when the likelihood is good? And indeed, uh, what she found is that there's a whole bunch of brain regions that correlate either with uh, 
uh, prior, uh, uh, with the prior or with the likelihood. In fact, it's interesting, a lot of the results relating to uncertainty in the likelihood seems to be in occipital regions, which is where vision is back then. My brain, a lot of information about, uh, about prior uncertainty appears to be in these areas like putamen, insula, amygdala. These are areas that people usually associate with uh, decision making. And, um, and equally, uh, there's uh, information about integration that's a Bowman plate on the right hand side. So if you're interested in this combination of priors and likelihood, I can just recommend a little, uh, a little edited book uh, there. Um, it's, uh, it was edited mostly by Michael Landy with Julia Thomas Hauser. Uh, it basically contains a lot of book chapters that are all about uh, about how price and likelihoods are combined and how, how likelihoods are combined with one another. So it's a whole book on the Bayesian combination of different cues. And in fact, you see Bayes rule here on the title of the book. So, um, but so far, I've been talking about this simple case where you have Gaussians. You have a Gaussian likelihood function and you have a Gaussian prior. And we briefly saw when we spoke about the work of Alan Stalker that in some cases we don't have Gaussian priors, we might have an exponential prior. But let's talk about like cases that get us out of this, uh, this domain. So let's think back to the, the old audiovisual cue combination. What is the assumption? So if you build a Bayesian model, there's always a modeling assumption of how you believe that the world works. In fact, when I look at someone doing my experiments, in a way, I have a model about them, namely that they solve the problem with Bayesian things. And I believe that they have a model about the world, about the experiments, about what's happening in my experiments. So let's talk about these models. So you can say, we might have a common cause model. Here, let me, let me pan here. So where you can say, I might believe that there exists something at some place, maybe here in visual space. And um, what, I, uh, what I see is produced by that thing. Maybe this is a bird that is singing. And then you can say, well, I can see the bird. Let me see if I can produce a bird here. Well, okay, I'm not very good at birds. Well, actually, I'm really bad at birds. Let's say you see a bird there and you hear like quick, the sound of a bird. Then you can say, if there's a common cause, I implicitly assume that there is this one location X here and the visual stimulus, what I see only depends on the location where it really is. And also the sound that I might be, uh, might be hearing from there here. Also that sound comes from the same location. In this case, the, what the right way of, of solving this problem is exactly is exactly what we had yesterday. And like both of these are now cues about the same thing. Each of these uh, might give us some probability distribution, maybe like this and like this. I can combine the two of them into an estimate. It won't always be perfect. No? Like, and, uh, and it's also important if I would repeat the same experiment many times, sometimes you would hear the tone further to the right. Sometimes you'd hear it further to the left. That's the, just the nature of your auditory system. And same thing, if I give you the same visual stimulus, sometimes it will appear that it's more to the left and sometimes it will appear that it's more to the right. But here's an alternative possibility. No? It could be that there's another bar that I, don't, that I don't see that's at one place. And I see a different bar at some place here. Now, those two are not at the same place. Now, that exists. No? Like we're in a world full of events. So therefore, it's far from certain that if I, if I hear something and I see something that these things even belong together. So now you can say, I now want to have a different model. The model says it could be that if I see and hear something, they come from the same place, which is this common cause case. It could also be that they just have nothing to do with one another. 
No, so if you ask me in this case, where is it? I can combine both of them. If I ask you in this case, where's the auditory place? It's obviously the same as the visual place. But in this case, if you ask me what's the auditory case, I want to only hear it. I don't want to see anything. The seeing isn't useful because it's really two different things. And um, and so let's see how uh, let's see how we can model this. No, and like uh, to be clear, how do we model such cases? No, and uh, and you in fact saw that in the in the exercises when we did the mixture of Gaussians, you can say, really we have p common, uh, p common times uh, times the probability of the data under this model. And we have P not common, so we have one minus P common in this case. So this is exactly the case that uh, we modeled in the second tutorial yesterday. Right, so, so let's see, so not, here we have a model. It's fully specified in a Bayesian way, where I can say I have a prior probability for the left versus the right. I uh, now, now let's let's get the intuition right. Under which circumstances would you believe that there's a common cause? Well, you're going to believe that there's a common cause if visual and auditory stimuli are very close to one another. In which case do you believe that they're independent? Well, if they're far away from one another. And uh, I think we just had uh, we we just had someone raise their hand. Thanks for raising yeah. your hand. Yeah. Hi. Hey, hi. BJ. Hi. Uh, so I, I, I guess you're trying to assume that the visual and the auditory signal come at the same instant of time. Yes. So, so the I, same I, time. I, sorry, I, I just, I just had. I mean, the, the picture. If I hear thunder and lightning, I know that it's the same physical cause, but there is a time delay. So I have to have some model of the back of my head to, even though there's a time delay, it's still the same phenomenon. Uh, yes. This is uh, this this is wonderful. So. Uh, in those scenarios, you know, like we want to, we will have some belief how probable is it that they have a common cause. In the case of thunder and lightning, we have strong reasons to believe that they come at different times, but that they come from the same place. Right. So if you, if there's just one lightning, even if it takes three seconds, I'm happy to hear the thunder coming from exactly where the place where that is. So that in, in a model like this is basically carried by this, how probable ex ante do I believe that they come from the same place? So for example, if a sound of a bird comes from the same place as me seeing it, depends on how crowded the world, uh, the, the auditory and visual world is. Like if I'm in a situation where there's a swarm of birds, hundreds mm -hmm. of them, then the probability that they belong together is very low. Whereas if there's if, if I'm in the desert, there's really just one bird and I hear weak, then the probability that they come from the same place is relatively high. And so in that literature of like the of what's called causal inference now, uh, within, and I should say the words causal inference are used differently in different communities. In the psychophysics community, this is what people mean when they say cause, uh, when they say causal inference. People have found that there's a lot of factors that influence the prior beliefs that we have. As you, as you suggested, DJ, you know, like I should like, if it's thunder and lightning, I should expect that time delays aren't very important. But if I see the bird's mouth open and then I see quick, uh, hear quick, a little later, that is surprising and, and not cool. And um, uh, or, or for example, but at the same time, if things happen very much at the same time, it's much more convincing that they belong together. So what I did here is I spoke about distance and space. Mm -hmm. But it's really like, uh, like in a way, as you suggest, VJ, it matters about distance and time. Mm -hmm. if, uh, and it matters about distance and space. And in fact, there's a wonderful illusion that, that, that you might have heard about, which is the rubber hand illusion. So mm -hmm. what they do is they make it that you can't see your hand. They basically cover it with the, with the, with the piece of cloth. And then what they do is they touch at exactly the same time, which is super important, and at the same space, uh, which is also super important, your hand and the rubber hand. And now you can say, if you believe that they're independent, it's very improbable that they would keep being stimulated at exactly the same time. Whereas if you believe that they're the same thing, 
it's very probable. So over time, in the rubber hand illusion, this common cause model gets to be more and more explanatory, if you want, for what's happening. And therefore, over time, those subjects where you do this stimulation, more and more accept that the rubber hand is their own. But like, yes, one, wonderful. No, like, and with all these Bayesian models, we live in this complicated world where the models aren't just like the models that we build. It's not like we have two things. They're like, just gosh, and we don't have anything else. No, we live in this world where, we, where there's all that information. And we need to combine all that information to be good at it. I thought we had another question. Yeah, Sanket, are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Conrad. Hey, Sanket. Thanks for, for asking a question. Yeah. Uh, so my question is kind of related to yesterday's uh, tutorial. So in that tutorial, we were using these values of P common and even the mean and the standard deviation as like given. So uh, maybe let's say you gave the example of a desert and seeing a bird. So uh, we can be sure at that instant that the sound came from that bird. But when we are building computer models, how do we supply these kind of probabilities um, like so that the computer model can predict anything? Um, this is a great question, and uh, and it's a hard question. So, in when we build Bayesian models, um, we usually construct them with deep human knowledge about what the problem is. Now, like the reason why we mo might model Q combination in the Ali and Buck type cases like this is because we really understand what that scenario is. Now, if we're in the real world and we talk about bots, then it's very difficult. Now, like, I can't write down the math of how you recognize bots. Exactly. So, uh, so that's why there is a newer phenomenon where people use, say, neural networks to solve those problems. And in fact, let me briefly talk about that link there. Because it's very opaque, and but you, but a lot of you will have heard how neural networks are very popular models now of uh, of even meant to explain neural and cognitive behavior. Um, neural networks, in a way, do something slightly similar here. So, so, so first, a neural network when you train it to deal with uncertain cases like this, will do exactly the Bayesian things. Let me first convince you of that. So if you're Bayesian, that being Bayesian is the best way of solving these problems. Now, like if I give you Gaussians, there's nothing that you can do, but the best estimate will always be to multiply priors and likelihood. Now, a neural network wouldn't know that. Now, I would maybe give it images of a bot or like more likely the way we do it, I would give it the image of like a visual Gaussian. And uh, I would give it some recording of the sound that we have there. And now in those domains, the best you can do is be Bayesian. And uh, neural networks can basically learn anything like that. They can suddenly learn these things over very short periods of time. So uh, if you take a neural network and you train it to do these kinds of tasks, now like I take the same experiments that I run on humans. And I have a neural network which sees the same thing, hears the same thing, everything the same. I give it enough trials, it will, it will eventually become Bayesian. It will become mm -hmm. indistinguishable from these models. And that I think is very, very important. And I wish that I had dedicated today's talk towards the underlying philosophy there. So, so will so, the neural so, network so, in this case uh, be able to adjust its? This, uh, these parameters of P common and maybe standard deviation according to the different stimuli? Yes, 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 exactly. That's the, that's the point. So the, the neural network doesn't know PC. Now, like nowhere in the neural network does it explicitly say PC. And nowhere in the neural network does it explicitly say one minus PC. And also nowhere in the neural network does it say sigma auditory. Right. Nowhere in the neural network does it say sigma v, but the sigma a, sigma v, pc are just tools that we use to solve the math in the end. Ultimately, what is it that a real uh, that that humans on neural networks get? They get auditory recordings, visual recordings, and then they get told if they did it right or wrong. 
So through doing it right or wrong, no, no, like, like if a human, if we do it in the optimal Bayesian way, there's going to be some input output mapping. There's going to be some visual. Uh, every combination of visual input and auditory input is going to map to some best possible estimate. We call it x hat in modeling usually. And so, so there's a function. There's an there's an optimal input to output function. A neural network will very quickly discover those things. So, so what that means is, is, is no, if we zoom out of these Bayesian models, is we expect in any case where we can build these Bayesian models that optimal behavior is close to the, the, the Bayesian statistics here. But we should also expect that any system that can learn well enough will eventually figure this out. You know, so, 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 so a neural network will be doing exactly the same thing after enough training, but it will not make explicit about the variances and so forth. So this means that the behavior of the neural network is identical, but we can no longer understand it. So the nice thing about these Bayesian systems is kind of, they are the most sophisticated systems where we can really understand why what's happening is happening. And that's why they're attractive. And that's why we've been building them. Now, there was a time about 20 years ago where people, would, uh, where people believed that like real world problems were best solved by Bayesian systems. That's because computers were slow and neural networks went overly popular at that point of time. But now we know that neural networks are really better at solving these problems. So, so now this leads us into a, a really weird situation. I want you all to be aware of that. If I want uh, to build systems that are good models for humans, now what does normative model mean? Normative model just means I build the best model for solving the problem. And then I compare it to what people do. In the real world, when we talk about deserts and bugs and situations like that, the best model will almost invariably be a machine learning model that basically takes the inputs that humans have the, and is trained to perform as well as possible on the task. It's also the power of them in a way. Now, like a neural network can deal with like the complexity. It can, for example, say, well, and if there's lots of bots visible, then we can often be wrong about that. So let's uh, let's let's assume, let's kind of like assume that they don't belong together more in cases where there's like lots of other things. And, uh, and so, so effectively neural networks can do justice to the problem, difficult problem that's there. So, so neural networks in a way are really quite close and usually closer than Bayesian models to the normative situation in real world tasks. Now, when we do these laboratory experiments, we design those laboratory experiments so that we can model them well. No, but if I ask you, how do you detect a bird? The right way to, maybe how do you recognize a bird? Now I can write down like as a Bayesian thing, recognizing a bird. In fact, for prompts like that, like look at our book. But at the same time, if I ask, well, how can I do that in the real world with the myriad of features that the real world has? then it pushes me very much into the space where I want to use neural networks. The only thing is for these Bayesian systems, I can explain to you exactly why they work the way they work. Whereas if I had a neural network, now like the neural network would never have told me about PC or visual or auditory uncertainty and those things. So in a way, I wouldn't really have understood what's going on. It would just have told me, yeah, like, I think a human will say that's about, and indeed a human will say that that's about. So neural networks can be very good at agreeing with humans. In fact, that's what we train them. Like if you look at the big competitions in machine learning, say ImageNet, you know, like for people who don't know ImageNet, there's a million images of thousand different types and humans say, well, that's a dax hunt. And, and basically it's all labeled by humans who say, what is on that photograph? And um, the best systems for that are neural networks. Human neural networks are slightly better than humans by now, but mostly they do it by just imitating humans. Now that means that in a way, these neural networks are really good models of what a human will say. In fact, they are a better model for what one human says than what another human says. So, so in that sense, they're, they're spectacular 
successful at that. But then I look at the neural network and it has 10 million parameters. No one knows what those 10 million parameters means. And uh, the whole point is that there's not one thing that it focuses on. Now, like the reason why we can model these things is because I only give you two things. I give you a visual thing and I know exactly what the visual thing is. It's just one dot. And I give you an auditory thing and I know exactly what it is. It's a white noise sound pulse coming from that direction. And that makes it possible to model it. But at the same time, that makes that jump to the real world be very difficult. And in fact, if anyone else has questions to this broader like neural networks versus space versus the philosophy of modeling, I'd love to discuss that. Any one other one follow up? One yes, follow up to this. Yeah, uh, so uh, you mentioned the importance of neural networks. So would it be right to say that neural networks have more practical value in the present world, like after the advent of all these TensorFlow and all those packages and uh, the Bayesian models are more of theoretical and less of practical practicality. Yes, so Bayesian modeling is not practically useful in all but a small number of cases. Neural networks are practically supremely useful. Let's, let, let me give you an example of that. Um, neural networks power a lot of the things that you use at the moment. You have a mobile phone, probably all of you. If I'm like, Siri, it, uh, it unlocks and, and listens to me. That's entirely a neural network. If I type, if, if I dictate something to it, that's a neural network. If I say it, Google, show me photographs of my car because I, I always forget where I parked my car. Uh, Google Images gives me a long list of all the photos that I ever took of my car and I always take a photo when I park my car. Super useful. Um, uh, neural networks are useful for, for optimal control. Neural networks are useful for, uh, for, for, uh, for recommender systems. So they're better at knowing which movies you are likely to watch than another person. So neural networks are supremely useful in that sense. Neural networks, uh, Bayesian statistics are only useful in very narrow domains. Let me give you a few domains where Bayesian uh, models are supremely useful. Let's say I'm an MD, uh, I, I do clinical trials. I, I now want to know, I've gotten some data, should I, should I continue my trial? For those things, they do what's called Bayesian trial design and is incredibly useful. In fact, the neural network people use Bayesian methods to optimize their parameters. So if you have a neural network, it has parameters like how many layers do you have? What's the learning rate? Uh, do I, how, what level of uh, dropout do, do we use? All those things. And um, they use for those estimates, they use Bayesian methods where they say, okay, let's run a few neural networks. Let's see how good they are. Let's assume that it's smooth and so forth. And then they do Bayesian things. So Bayesian methods are often good if we're in that domain where we have very, very little data. And that's still the domain where they are hard to beat. So if I understand the world, then Bayesian statistics is the best thing that I can do. And if I have a lot of data, then Bayesian statistics is bad. And here's, here's why, you know, like Bayesian statistics, humans build in what they know about the data. And, and that's good because we understand what we are doing there. If we do machine learning, say neural networks, then we replace this humans building things largely with the data builds things. Now, what that means is that we will have less data, you know, like because uh, or we need more data because we need to train the neural network with all the, with all the weights and so forth that it has. So usually neural networks need more data of much more data than if we can be based. You know, if we can be based in, Often we don't have any really free parameters. We really understand these things. But the models that us humans have about the world are always wrong. Not like I, we, we're like, yeah, there's like the visual system and it's independent of the auditory system. That's not actually quite true. Why not? Because if I rotate my head, my eyes move with my head, but my ears also move with my head. So if I, if I make a mistake at where exactly my head is in space, 
then that mistakes carries over to both vision and audition. Now that in turn means that audition and vision aren't quite perfectly independent. They're just mostly independent. And, uh, and therefore our model isn't quite right. So if you give me enough data, I can discover how variables depend on one another. And no human will ever be quite right because it's, the world is never like quite that simple. And that's why in the real world, as long as we can get large amounts of data, usually Bayesian, uh, Bayesian models will be will underperform relative to neural networks. Cool, that was a long answer to a short question. Sorry about that. Any other questions about that broader set of, I mean, like, I think like for a lot of you, you know, you're like early in the career. And I think it's important about that clarity, you know, like some people use neural networks to model, some of them use Bayesian statistics, some of them use both. Now my lab, lab uses, uh, uses uh, neural networks to model psychophysics and my lab uses Bayesian statistics to model psychophysics. Um, we wouldn't use Bayesian statistics uh, apart from rare cases when we want to solve technical problems. For that, we use a lot of neural networks. Why? Because neural networks work really well with big data sets. And, but at the same time, I wouldn't do, or it's hard to see how to do good psychophysics with neural networks. And let's say the neural network, I train it to do dogs versus cats recognition. And I now say, are neural networks similar to humans at dogs versus cat uh, uh, recognition? Well, there might be, there might not be. The amount of similarity might be interesting, but even if the neural network was good, I'm not sure how much that moves me forward. Now, like, I'm like, okay, now I have a neural network. It makes the same mistakes as humans when recognizing cats versus dogs. Uh, can I explain you why? No, I have no idea. And, 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 and that's why a lot of psychophysics often is on, it uses Bayesian techniques. That's also why much of neuroscience uses Bayesian techniques because they are interested in, in basically ideas on how can we find reflections of the model in the brain. And, uh, and that's, very, that's more difficult with neural network. Although I should mention here, there's the idea of of, uh, of a representational similarity analysis where you can say, I have a neural network, I have all the 10,000 neurons at some level, at some la layer, what do they share with the neurons that I recorded from? So there exists like emerging ideas where you can say, how does, an, how is a neural network similar or dissimilar to, uh, to what, uh, what, uh, what people do and or, or how the brain works. Cool, any more questions? I know there was a big detour here. Okay, if there's no more questions, but thanks for, for these questions. Look, I think like you will all learn more if you ask the questions that you find interesting. And maybe I want to already encourage you, if anyone has questions that they should, that they want to debate, I will otherwise go through like a broad set of papers to kind of give you a little bit of more of an idea of like, what's happening in that and what's been happening in this Bayesian field. Good, hold on. I now need to reshare my screen, otherwise you can't see anything. Okay, here we are. Um, the, the various causes. Now let me go back to that power. Cool, okay, so we have this test here. Now we can go and say, well, how do we experimentally test that? And this is a beautiful paper by Wallace and, 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 and a set of papers by Wallace and Hairston and a few others. What they did is they always have, they, they have the subjects in a dark room. They have a yoke. It's this thing with basically, it's, it's like a gun for shooting a laser pointer in a way. And they have, lots of, they have fixation LEDs. So they make you always look at the same spot because they want to avoid that there's an effect of, of eye movements. And then they have LEDs that flash on. And then behind the LEDs, they have lots of loudspeakers. And then what they do is they calculate as a function of spatial disparity. So, so in every experiment, what's gonna happen, it's gonna be an LED flashes, 
and a sound that goes and then what they do is they change the they, they turn on random LEDs and random target speakers. And on this axis, you have the spatial disparity. The spatial disparity is if the LED is here and the loudspeaker is there, what's the angle between those two? Yeah, so for example, if we had, if this LED was on, oh, you only just now start seeing my screen, uh, apparently. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, no, we, here, we could see it, Conrad. Uh, okay, you could see it because I just had a pop up on my screen, which says participants can now see your screen. It's good that they that they could see it. So so basically, uh, here like like if that LED is on and that loudspeaker, that might be five degrees uh, of spatial disparity. Now, and to come back to this model, we should now expect if spatial disparity is large, we should say well they're independent, they have nothing to do with one another. If they're close. Yeah, they probably depend on one another. And that's exactly what we see here. What you see in red is this Bayesian model that we just fit to that. What you see in black is the experimental data from them. What we see here on the y-axis is they were just asked, do you think uh, sound and, uh, and light came from the same place? Do you think they came from a different place? If they're from the same place, choose common cause. What we see here, small spatial disparities, high probability of common cause, which decreases as spatial disparity gets to be larger. Now, let's talk about some funny effect here. So what they also did is they measured as a function of spatial disparity, the gain. Now, let, let, let me highlight what the gain is. Um, we are in that situation where, uh, where uh, the subjects were just asked, tell me where you hear it to be coming from. Not like they weren't asked about the auditor, uh, about the visual stimulus. Now, uh, the gain is if the visual, if the auditory stimulus is here and the visual stimulus is there, and you then estimate this, that would be a gain of one, which means basically visual capture. You only rely on what you see. If this is the auditory stimulus and this is the visual stimulus, and I say this, it would be a gain of zero. If the visual stimulus is here and the auditory stimulus is here, and I tell you that my auditory stimulus is there, that would be a negative gain. And now what they did is they divided the data into two halves. They divided the data in, uh, in, into a part where people said, yes, there's a common cause. And you see in gray the data from Wallace Helston. And um, you can see that uh, that if people say yes, there's a common cause, the gain is almost 100%. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It uh, means that uh, vision is so much better than audition. So if I believe they belong together, I uh, I will I will I, I will basically have a high gain, as I should by Bayesian principles. Now let's look at what's going on down there. I like that's super weird. What we have here is if people say there's two causes, no, they say they're independent. What would what what would we naively have been expecting? Well, uh, if they have nothing to do with one another, well then vision shouldn't influence anything. You know, like this would have been my expectation. So that's what I expect. But what they experimentally measured is that the gain is super negative. Does anyone have an idea why that would be happening? No, it's super weird. If I say the two of them have nothing to do with one another and the auditory stimulus was here and the visual stimulus was there, on average, I will say the auditory stimulus was there. Does that make any sense? It's a puzzle. And I wonder if anyone can, can, can figure it out. It took us a little bit of thinking to, to, to get at it. But it's, it's, it's like one of these, once you, once you see it, once you realize it, it's very obvious. But at first, it seems entirely nonsensical. Now the gain should be zero. 
Because if you tell me the two have nothing to do with one another, then audition shouldn't influence anything. Okay, well, let's uh, let's see. I should just say there's another cool paper. There's a cool paper by Sato et al. from 2007 that also finds the same. I mean, like their fit is slightly different to ours because their model is a little bit different to our model, but it's also a Bayesian model, also a causal inference type model. Um, they find the same thing. So, so it's probably real, not like if two people find the same, two groups find roughly the same effects, it must be real. So the models describe that, but why? What's going on here? Well, here's what's going on. So what we have here is a selection artifact. Science is full of selection artifacts that people don't know about and that they attribute to crazy other sources. So. Imagine for the time being that the visual stimulus is always perceived at five. No, like we're in that situation. Zero is auditory stimulus, right stimulus is at five degrees to the right. Okay, the, the auditory stimulus is always here. Now, every row, these are the trials. Now, this is the first experiment I show you some auditory stimulus, some visual stimulus. Now, hold on. Let's first be clear. The auditory stimulus is always zero, but what I don't measure is what arrives in your brain. And I told you that there's 30 degrees noise in the auditory stimulus. So if my stimulus is really at zero, sometimes it will arrive at minus two. Sometimes it will arrive at minus 20. Sometimes it will arrive at plus 20. You know, like there's gonna be some distribution here. In fact, in this experiment, it was, it was less than 30 degrees. I think it was more like five degrees. Okay, so there's gonna be a distribution. And for in each trial, the auditory stimulus is going to be different. And we assume for the time being that the visual stimulus is just perfect. It's always at five, you know, because the effect is there. Now, under which circumstances will I say that the two of them have a common cause? Well, I will say that if they are close to one another, this is the domain where they're close to one another. Now, Keep in mind that the auditory position here is a Gaussian centered on zero. But now what's happening is uh, these guys here, now like uh, all these guys here that are to the right, I will say, oh, it's one cause because I perceive them to be very close to one another. So these guys all are wrongly put into the bin of saying they have, uh, they have one cause. They don't have one cause. No? In this case, one of them was at zero, the other one was at five. But in these cases, the person, the subject, will wrongly think that they come from the same source. So we have a Gaussian here that's mean zero. But we now took that Gaussian, we threw away all of this. All of these go into the bin of basically, this is one cause. That's why we are getting these negative effects. We took a Gaussian. We expect that it would be uh, we we expect that it would be flat, but uh, that it would be zero. But after cutting away the right half, now the mean of a Gaussian is no longer zero; it's negative, and this is exactly the effect that we see here. And that's why the the the, the two causes model exactly predicts that. And the, and and this is something that we need to be very mindful when we do any kind of experiment. If I do an experiment. I, I will often maybe divide the trials into the successful and the unsuccessful trials. But keep in mind that the fact that I divide them like that makes what arrives in the brain no longer be the same. And I think it's important to realize what's going on there. And like we have X, which is our stimulus. But this X never arrives in the brain. What arrives in the brain is some noisy version of that x tilde. That is what I have here on the x-axis here, x tilde. That's what actually arrives in the brain. X never does. And then we produce our estimate x hat out of it. Now, we, people often model this as if this x hat, if, as if it didn't even exist. It does exist. And if you ignore this part out of your model, and that even exists among Bayesian people, then your model is just strictly wrong. 
So, and that is because that is why there's variability. You know, why is it if I do the same experiment? I'm like, show me where you heard it, but I always give you the same auditory stimulus. You will always be different. Why will you be different? Because well, you have noise. There's X tilde. X tilde is a version of that, which makes model fitting very difficult for Bayesian models. Because if you want to say something about the model, now this is what Bayesian stats is about. This is what we are talking about today. But if you want to do experiments, you need to handle that X tilde. And if you want to be Bayesian about being experiment, you need to consider all possible values of X tilde along with the relevant probability if you want to actually fit to human subjects. Very few experimentalists do that. And that leads to mistakes. And this selection bias is just one of the many mistakes that, that you get there. No, and it, all, it only occurs because of the X tilde. If that wasn't there, then the if, if, if what would go into the brain is really the real position, well, then all stimuli would be here. And we would have had exactly what we expected here, that it should be a flat line. But that's not what we get. We get it because the X tilde exists. And if you look at the, at the, at the Bayesian book that we are right, that we're finishing, it focuses on these three pieces and how you need to handle all of them. For every single Bayesian experiment, you need to have three steps. You need to solve this. What would I do if someone gave me X tilde? And then it needs to have this outer piece, which is the experiment. If I'm the experimentalist, how should I think about what's going on in the person who's doing my experiment? And those two are very different and they're often conflated with one another and lead to a lot of mistakes there. And that, that, that problem, in fact, equally exists if we fit neural networks or something. The important thing is what arrives in the brain is not what our stimulus is. Cool, we can then also use the same kind of model to predict the variance in human behavior. There you see uh, uh, the cases where they say there's two causes versus there's one cause. And you can see as a function of spatial disparity, you can see the standard deviation of the estimate. And you can see that in the case where they say there's two causes, there's much higher standard deviation than when they say there's one cause, which directly falls out of the network. Great, any questions about this? Now, this is like a really weird case, but it's the simplest case where one can see how crucial it really is to do this like two level modeling process where you can say there is something outside of the world and then there's what arrives in the brain and then there's the optimal potentially estimate that you have. Okay, great. If there's no more que no questions. And again, I, I love the questions. Uh, so, so please don't, don't be scared about asking questions. So let's take that same idea to movement science. I move and I make a mistake. We always make mistakes. Um, in the cool thing about movement experiments is I can make the experiment happen. You move here, your fingers there, but I don't show you where your finger is. I show you your finger perturbed. So instead of here, I show you your finger at the wrong spot or the cause at the wrong spot. It's a perturbation. And we can then see how do you learn in those cases. So what we did here is we changed the amount of visual disturbance. So we either perturb you a little bit, not like you move here and then we move it a little up. Now, if you move 10 centimeters. Conrad, yes. sorry to interrupt. There is a question in the chat box. Oh, what, wonderful. Thank you for interrupting. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me see here in the chat box. OK, cool. Uh, so we have a question by Mitali Patil, who asks, is there noise in perception of auditory stimulus because the medium through which the stimulus travels is not stable? Yes, and lots of other sources as well. No? So, so if there's a sound somewhere, 
the sound can appear that it comes from somewhere else because it gets diffracted in the world. Maybe there's other objects or something. There's reverberation. So in that sense, there exists real noise and, and there could be wind, things like this. There exists real noise in the outside world, but there also exists noise that's then part of our own body. You, know, you can say the sound wave hits my ear uh, the wave propagates through the system. There's noise being added of many, many different kinds. And uh, arguably, there's also noise being added by the brain itself. So the idea is that this noise that we talk about, always talk about like sigma or the auditor, sigma visual, that that combines all of them. It combines noise at where the data is generated with noise in the transmission medium, with noise in the physics that ultimately translates it into neural signals with noise that happens afterwards. And that's one of the reasons why things are so Gaussian in many cases, because there's so many different sources for the noise. Um, okay, and here we have a question by Rain Yi. Thanks always for the great questions. Can you determine the nature of noise added to the stimulus? Like, would it be one over F or white? Uh, this is a great question. Um, the assumptions that we use in modeling is usually that it's Gaussian. And the reason why we do that assumption is exactly because there's so many different sources of noise. But, um, but there are cases where, say, it's log normal in, in some cases. And there can be cases where the noise spectrum is different. The thing is, Measuring the noise spectrum is relatively difficult. You know, like it's, if I want to just know, do you know that you have noise? That's relatively easy. I give you something and I ask you to bet on it. Whereas if I want to ask, do you believe that noise in the world is Gaussian or is your noise Gaussian? Then, so what we usually do, you know, like we do these so-called two alternative false choice experiments. I presume you will have heard about it from previous speakers. I give you one stimulus, maybe moving a little bit. I give you another one moving a little faster. And you have as a function of the delta speed here, that's the change in speed. You will have the probability that you make the right decision. And then you will usually get curves that look like this. You know, like it starts, if it's obviously that the first stimulus is left, then you like say the first stimulus. And then uh, if it's obvious that the second one is, then you say the second one, and there's some transition. Now, the Gaussian, we can, uh, how do we know the standard deviation of the Gaussian? We basically look where this curve gets from 25% to 75%. That's what's called the just noticeable difference. Now, if we wanted to see what, what the implied noise is, uh, or what the noise is, uh, what the noise distribution is, what we'd need to do is we would need to basically add extra parameters to that and compare maybe the 12 and the 87%. Like we would need to look at the curve in those pieces. But in those pieces, we usually have much less data because keep in mind that like going from 25 to 75, that's a big interval. We can basically use all our data. Whereas going from 75 to 87 or something, that's a very small amount of data. So figuring out what the exact noise distribution is, is very difficult. I am pretty sure that people tried it, but, uh, but, but it's, it's notoriously hard. And, and I'm, I'm kind of sure that there's a literature doing that, but it's, it's, it's very, very difficult in, the, in that context. Cool, so let's, let's briefly talk about this experiment. So what we have is we have a person moving, <coughs> moving their finger from one place to another, and then uh, we do a perturbation at the end. Now, why is causal inference relevant here? You can say you move, and if you move, it could be that you make a mistake. In fact, if I make on a 10 centimeter move, I make a one centimeter mistake, I'm not surprised at all. In fact, you can try that. You have a piece of paper here. You start somewhere, you draw yourself a target about 10 centimeters to the right, and then you do just a really fast one. I tried 
as well as I could to get from there to this point. And uh, what you saw is I was like about a centimeter, which is quite typical. So if I make a mistake of one centimeter, I'll be like, yeah, that's totally compatible with the common cause model. That is me who made that mistake. But now you can say, what if I make an eight degree, eight centimeter mistake? I move from here to here, but my hand is there. I'm like, no, I like totally didn't do this. I did this. There's no way on earth that I did this. So you can say the interpretation of the common cause model now is, yes, I made that mistake. The interpretation of the independent causes is like, you just showed me a dot. It has like nothing to do with whatsoever with what I just did. And this is what we basically quantified here. So we find when we find here that there's an inner region here where behavior is nice and linear. And then you see the outer region where behavior is much less than linear. In fact, it goes back towards zero. This is, we expect that we reach zero if we are all the way out there. And in fact, the model predictions are somewhat like that we start, uh, no, no, hold on, that we start at zero, then we go up a little bit, then we go negative a little bit, and then we ultimately go back to zero. That's what we should have under that Gaussian causal influence, which is roughly what we see here. Great, so let's see, we have 20 minutes time left. Um, let, let me, so let me just briefly give you the gist of, of, of other things. Now you can say, when we talk about uncertainty, where's uncertainty coming from? And uncertainty can come from lots of places. And there's uncertainty about priors and uncertainty about likelihoods. And um, uncertainty about prior, uh, about likelihoods, I can just say there's a wonderful pipe, a paper by Mike Landy uh, and, and, and Mamassian, I think, where they ask how, if you change the amount of information, say how many dots you have or something, how that affects prior, uh, how that affects likelihoods. What we did here is we asked it about priors. Now, uh, effectively, we asked about priors about where is your hat. Now, why do we need priors? Well, it turns out that if my hand is under, no, if I do an experiment, my hand will be under some kind of a plate, so I won't be seeing my hat. So if I don't see my hat, uh, I will have some uncertainty. Now, if I look at my hat, I, the uncertainty will be small. So what we can compare is we can compare you see your hand, in which case your prior should be pretty, pretty good, pretty low variance if you want. Then And then we compare it. You haven't seen your hand for a while. And, uh, and then I make you sit for a long time where you don't sit your hand. In that case, we should expect that you get progressively more uncertain over time. And what we did here is to read out how you do that is the adaptation rate. So what we do, so, so there's one thing where we can say, I, I, you move from here to here, I see your, um, I give you some feedback in between, I see how much you rely on the feedback versus the prior. The alternative thing that I can do is I just perturb you. And uh, then I ask, well, what's gonna happen next time? And that's what we did for the adaptation rate expense. It's just a different way of, of asking you. In this case, if you want your estimate is something that builds up over time from the errors that you make. In any case, what we find is indeed the feedback that I give to you makes you more or less uh, less confident about your situation as it should be. Now let's see, let's go through one more little paper here and then I want to have some time for discussion. So um, traditionally, how, how do we think about movement adaptation, movement learning? You can say we have some input, we have the motor system, lots of parameters. It sends out what we want to do through the muscles. We make an error and that then feeds back into our system. According to that view, we only ever change the, the, our brain and our representations when we make an error. If we don't make an error, we should, nothing should be happening. Everything should be stable. Like we, we should only learn from errors. In fact, if we learn like they hypothesized for neural networks, all the learning happens through gradients. If I don't make an error, no learning. 
well, it turns out that the brain does learn, uh, does change, if uh, even if we don't see anything. So here, um, uh, let's talk about a different kind of uncertainty, which is uncertainty about time scales. We have muscle properties. Now, muscles change in lots of ways over time. Now they they get fatigued, nutrients. Right now, I'm a little hungry for training. If we lift weights, our brain changes, disease, and so forth. And that all is then affecting the, uh, the actual movements. But if I'm fatigued, I need to start, send stronger commands to my muscles to produce the same kind of movement. Now, it's hard to observe these properties. It's easy to observe the actual movements. Therefore, none of the papers are written about these hard to observe muscle properties. So let's talk about the kinds of experiments. So these are uh, McLaughlin type experiments. We, we start the eye at one position and then while the eye is in flight, oh no, the animation died. Uh, okay, so the eye moves from here to here, but instead of you now being right, we cheat. We take this one away and we only show you this one which is gonna make it look like, oh my God, my movement was just 30% 30, 30 too strong. And um, we can then build a Bayesian model for that way. can say, well, I might have a slow way, something that slowly changes in my brain, maybe like a, random, a slow Gaussian random walk and something fast, maybe like fatigue. Now the gain that we'd have on our muscles would be the sum of these two processes. And so then the motor gain fluctuates like that, which is not wide noise, but it is noise where every time scale uh, is, uh, is in a way equally important in that sense that they provide the same amount of variance. Now, how does the model look like? Uh, we have disturbances at different time scales. In our model, there's not just two, there's a whole continuum of them. Everything goes away on its own time scale. That's why we have the one minus one over tau. So all these terms just exponentially go away, but on their own time scale, and there's noise on it. And the noise is drawn just such a way that they're all equal important. The gain is now the sum of all of them and the observation. The mistake I make is the gain plus some observation noise. And there we have a parameter. We basically assume that the variance produced by each time scale is equally important and you will see some variants of that. So it turns out that under that assumption, what we have here, the optimal inference model for that is a common filter. And we have that the estimate of T plus one is, uh, is uh, M times ST, where M contains the time advancement here, plus the common gain times the gain error. And indeed, if we, if we do that and apply to, so here what, what we have is the monkey saccad uh, uh, data. So we have every dot is one saccade. You see, this is a crazy number of experiments. Here you see the gain. So the monkey has to go 30 degrees. Gain of 1.1 means that it went by 33. Gain 0.9 means it went 37. And you can see we make it sound as if the monkey is 30% too strong. And then over time, it gets it right. And then once we go back to normal, it's, it takes a similar number of saccades to go back. And we have that same thing for our model, which shows the same general properties. And I should say, um, we can use this not just to describe that data, but many different data sets. Now, there's something not quite, not quite normative about that. Now, mind you that here, we basically make this stuff up. It's not measured. We just say, well, let fatigue and, and, and all those things, let them all be equally important. But, but why? No, like it's like, it's a little hand way. We just saying they're all important. So can we measure them? And in fact, we can. So here's why this is difficult. Normally, while you move your eyes, your eyes get stronger and weaker. But we can't measure that your eyes get stronger and weaker, eye muscles get stronger and weaker. We can no way measure that because at the same time, your brain does adaptation. So if your muscles are too strong, then your brain figures out that they're too strong and makes them move less until we can no longer see things. But here's a cool idea we had that Mark Albert had, which is that if we take a monkey that has cerebellar lesions, all this gain adaptation 
and eye movement is all a cerebellar phenomenon. If you have a big lesion in the cerebellum, you just don't adapt. Therefore, we can measure the way your eye properties fluctuate by just looking at monkeys that have that. So we can measure the time scales of change and build an optimal adaptation system. And then we're tr truly normative because what we build in is knowledge about how the eye actually works and what we then build from that. And we use these uh, these uh, the cerebellar lesion monkeys for that. From there, we then have a real prediction of how healthy monkeys should adapt. Now, you can say without the cerebellum, they don't adapt. If the cerebellum is as predicted by Bayesian common filtering, then um, we should be able to predict what the healthy cerebellum will do based on the way the eyes change. And um, that's what we see here. So there we have lesion data. And uh, we have in green, we see the equal variance model that we assumed for the original paper with Shatner. And, um, and we, we see another older paper, uh, paper of mine. And then what we, uh, what we instead do is in red, we have the fit to that. And then you can see what that explains. It explains is if we look over many days, you can see how, uh, how the, and, and uh, you see here saccade gain, just the same as before, it's just blood so that we can better see that. In red, you see the previous model, the weighted variance, and you can see that it gets to be quite bad later in time. And then, uh, uh, no, hold on. In green, you see uh, how it gets to be biased over time. And in red, you see when we do this fit, it does a better job at that. And with that, I want to wrap up here and have time for some good discussion. And um, in any case, yeah, thanks so much for, uh, hold on here, uh, stop share. Uh, great. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope we'll have a little bit of a discussion. And thank you for listening, by the way, everyone. Thank you so much, Conrad. That was all fascinating work. Uh, any questions from the audience? You can raise your hand. And uh, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. So maybe I can ask you a, a more neural circuitsy question. You talked about cerebellar lesions. Um, are there other lesions that people have tried that interferes with this process or is this all cerebellum centric? So, so my understanding of the, uh, of the uh, saccadic gain adaptation literature is that it's almost purely um, a, a cerebellar phenomenon. So if you take out the cerebellum, it just doesn't adapt anymore. And, uh, and now that, that of course doesn't mean that there's nothing else, but I don't believe that. So, so for example, if you, if you would say lesion- the Inferior olive maybe? Yeah, you would probably abolish eye movements. Uh, okay. Like, 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 so, so the way I understand that is that say the, the the superior colloquies and, and the, the whole socket involved there is what chooses where to move the eyes to, and then the cerebellum makes sure you do it in the right way. But then again, that is not my specialty. So, so mm -hmm. I may very well miss some, some other lesions. Okay. But adaptation there is assumed to be a cerebellar phenomenon. All right, all right. Any questions? <laughs> well, if there's no questions, then either it was entirely incomprehensible or it was, <laughs> it was clear, wonderful. <laughs> I think maybe people are still digesting it, probably. Maybe they're still digesting it. Uh, yeah, please feel free to ask any questions.
Ah, there's one. So there are two questions. Do you want me to read it out to you? Or can um, you see? Yeah, no, I can see them. So, okay. so we have a question by Anna Leona <coughs> Rivera, who asks, you make the strong assumption that there's Gaussians behind it. And yes, I mean, like the, the, the way how we justify Gaussians generally is that uh, due to the central limit theorem, if we have enough contributions to uh, of different noise sources, things will eventually look Gaussians. Gaussian. There exist cases where say log normal distributions are better fits. But in general, yes, uh, like the reason why we do that is just that, that it's very difficult to be powered to see deviations from Gaussians. Like if we assume Gaussians, then we have maximal power and it's relatively easy to see it. And that's the best answer that I have. Do I believe that in reality things are actually Gaussian? No, I don't. I'm not even sure what Gaussians mean when I ask about, say, uh, how I think about, let's say, the person I'm I'm video uh, talking with. Uh, so so it's a so so in a lot of domains that's not so useful. But like in the kinds of phenomena that we do in lab settings, they just seem to usually if people look for it, they see very little deviations. But again, it's such that seeing the deviations would be hard to be well powered. We have a question from Ma Magdi Khalil, who asks, could quantum mechanics play a role in brain adaptation? Um, I think the majority consensus at the moment is that quantum mechanics are probably not very relevant for neuroscience. So quantum mechanics are really important at the micro scale where you can say maybe the dynamics of individual molecules are meaningfully affected by uh, by quantum mechanics but a molecule is already pretty macroscopic so quantum effects are going to be relatively weak at that level in all likelihood the brain is also warm which means that coherence lengths would generally be small and um and on top of it, uh, now like uh, each nerve cell has countless channels, many, many thousands. And therefore the, in the, 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 the effect of the quantum noise should be relatively small at the end. Again, I'm not excluding that somewhere in the brain quantum mechanics could be relevant, but I don't think it, it will describe much variance. Um, we have a question by Anna Leonor Rivera. Um, uh, oh, no, she, she was just summarizing it. Yes. So, so for example, uh, let, let me give you an example of log normal distribution. So um, let's talk about speed. You're really good at knowing the difference between stationary and moving just a tiny bit but you're really bad at knowing the difference between 10 meters per second and 10.1 meters per second. That's in effectively impossible. So it seems that in that domain, when it comes to what's distinguishable with one another, is really about the log domain. You can like, you're really good at like knowing the difference between, between slow and like a tiny bit faster <laughs> but like you definitely don't know the difference between these two movements which was much higher than that so those are the domains where lock normals are, are more like uh, appear to be the right way of modeling things any further questions hmm? <laughs> Well, in that case, all I can say is thanks everyone for listening and, uh, and, and thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Conrad. It was uh, brilliant to have you here both yesterday's tutorial and today's lecture. I think they all enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we also now with your talk uh, come to the end of the school. So Vijay has a, a few announcements to make about the future schools. And I would like to now summarize the uh, school shortly. 
We also have Venki Murthy, who's another organizer. Um, so um, we had a very nice uh, two weeks here. Uh, we started out with models of uh, single synapses, which uh, Suhita did brilliantly, and followed it up with models of neurons and also of networks, simple networks, such as those that control the movement in Hydra. So we had a nice you know, uh, progression from simple, relatively simple organisms to more complex organisms such as humans, going from Hydra to then Drosophila, looking at olfactory navigation in Drosophila, followed by visual navigation in Drosophila, by Larry, very beautiful lectures on models of how the Drosophila orients itself in space, followed by two lectures on uh, zebrafish, sensory signaling, as well as how in a whole brain approach, we can look at behavior using these uh, simple vertebrates. And now yesterday and today, we've had lectures by uh, Professor Conrad, as well as uh, Professor Daniel Wolpert, looking at sensory motor integration and motor learning in humans and Bayesian models of uh, sensory motor integration. So this was a very nice finale for the entire school. So very, very happy with all the students who were very interactive posting questions here on the chat and also taking up discussions on the Slack channel. Thank you for your participation. And I also sincerely hope that you all derived as much fun from it as we did organizing it and sitting through the lectures here over the last uh, two weeks. Thank you very much. And now over to you, Vijay. Thanks, uh, Vatsala. Binky, you have anything to say? I just have a couple of announcements for the next. No, no, I really don't have much to say. I just want to actually extend a special thanks to Vatsala and you for you know, carrying the lion's share of, um, of I don't know, moderating and having having the discussions going. Um, it was a little bit harder for me to be too engaged from here, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to be involved and thanks to everybody. Thank you. Uh, let me also extend a, a nice thanks to everybody who participated. I just also want to thank uh, ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, who are our partners in this, in this program. And this is at the 10th edition of the school. Uh, so, as most of you know, this is a school that runs jointly between ICTP and ICTS, and the next school in 2022 is going to be held in ICTP, hopefully in person, and that will be about machine learning approaches to biology. Uh, the application is not open yet, sometime in uh, June, July, May, June, July is when it will start up. So keep an eye out and uh, look out for the applications. And that's also uh, promising to be a very, very nice school. Um, another announcement is that all the participants will get feedback forms from ICTS. Uh, please provide feedback, uh, both the pluses and the minuses. It will be nice to learn uh, what went good and what did not go good so that we can sort of uh, fix things uh, for the future schools. Uh, it will be very useful if you give us some very nice and uh, honest uh, feedback. Um, that's sort of the end of the school. If any of the participants want to say something, uh, please, you can unmute yourselves and uh, express your opinion. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a hand up. Kirwani Kandala, can you please unmute? Yeah, so I just wanted to um, speak about the school. Uh, so I was really skeptical when I applied. I'm, I'm a second year undergraduate. Uh, so uh, the school was like, it's aimed for doctoral students and early career faculty. So, uh, but, uh, and uh, I, after attending the school and listening to the lectures and all, uh, although um, I was like having a lot of difficulty understanding every single thing, I'd like to say that uh, the school has had helped me a lot in, uh, in improving uh, my uh, uh, knowledge and uh, it, it definitely has put some perspective 
So thank you so much for uh, this call. Welcome. Happy, happy to know that and you found it useful. Okay, so I mean, you can give us more formal feedback also on, on the Google feedback form. Uh, it'd be great if you can uh, do that. Um, I guess that's it. So that sort of closes the school formally. Uh, take care, stay safe. Hopefully we'll see you in person um, in one of the schools.